the velocity of money, that is something that central banks cannot control. Gold and silver are the elements that are gonna protect in what's coming. We wanna be prepared. Please join us for our next live stream Sunday, December 22nd at 9 p.m. Eastern. We'll go over current events, past guests, and of course, gold and silver news. Once again, our next live stream will be Sunday, December 22nd, 9 p.m. Eastern. See you then. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira. Once again, if you are new to this channel or you have not already done so, please do subscribe, click on the bell to be notified on new updates, and do give us a thumbs up. If you like what we do, we appreciate your support. Today we have with us a return guest, Justin Rosioara, who is the author of God's Money, an in-depth examination of the Bible verses that mention gold and silver. A fascinating read about what the ancient Bible text really has to say about gold, silver, and money. For the writing of this book, Houston dedicated thousands of hours to studying money, currencies, credit, and precious metals. Born in Romania under the then communist regime, he witnessed the fallacies of a corrupt system that had no respect for individual freedom. He now lives in the United States, and we are delighted to have him back again as a return guest. Good day, Houston, and welcome back again to SBTV. How are you doing? Hi, Patrick. I'm, I'm doing well. Thanks, uh, thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to have me. Sure, we're, we're glad you had, you had time to, to come back. You're, the first interview we had re regarding your book, God's Money, was a pretty interesting interview, had a lot of uh, comments on it, so we, we knew we had to get you back, and this time you have a little bit of a different topic to talk about. So again, we're, we're glad we, we can uh, bring you back on. So we, we last spoke with you in, in March of this year about your book, God's Money, where you shared your research on biblical verses about gold and silver from the books of Genesis and going up to, to Judges. And it's a pretty fascinating read, my friend, a well-written book. And I've, I've put the link to that interview with yourself at, at the top right-hand corner and also in the video description. So I, I hope viewers do watch that, that video that we had done prior. But Houston, may I know if you are working on a follow-up book to share about gold and silver in the other books of the Bible? Um, yes, it is a it is an ongoing project, and I knew when I started that it's gonna take a few years. The challenge that I have is that uh, you know it's kind of a, a a discovery, continuous discovery. So the more you study, uh, it's, this book writing this book requires a lot of study, and the more you study, you kind of find out new things and. The more you discover of the new things, you find out that there are even more. So it's like it seems like it's a it's a never never ending process. But yes, it is advancing, uh, and I have enough material for for the second volume right. that is drafted. is not in a in a in a concise form yet, but I have a lot of notes and and materials that I can use. But lately, I've been dedicated a lot of time to uh, developing this uh, this website, doubtableratio.com, and um, that has been taking most of the time. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna dive into that in in a little bit. But I completely understand what you're saying about um, the information. Um, it seems like every time you pick up that Bible, open it up, you're you can read the same verse, and somehow it'll speak to you in a, in a different way or or tell you something else. So I, I understand what you mean. Um, but at a time where money is a uh, paper or digital currency, which can be created out of thin air, do you think that digital currency is doomed to fail eventually as they do not have the stability like uh, gold and silver as money? Um, well, I think first we need to to define what means digital money. So actually, if you go back to the to the origins of the word digital, the, the digit means finger, and this is how the people used to count, and this is that's why digital means also um, uh, numbers. That that's in Latin language. Mm -hmm. uh, digital means also uh, numbers. So everything that is digital, it's about numbers. So uh, w there are actually four elements that uh, that have monetary labels attached to it. So the first is money, which is actually when monetary label 
as a unit of value is uh, or a measurement of value is related to a quantity of metal. We don't have that anymore. The second is currencies is when it's an arbitrary imaginary uh, measurement of value that has a monetary label attached to it. And when I talk about monetary labels, I mean dollars, euros, uh, Swiss francs, Japanese yen, British pounds, and so on. So currency is one thing. This is what we normally call money nowadays. Mm -hmm. And then we have the credit. That is the, um, the money that is created uh, in the banking system through the fractional reserve. And the fourth element are the financial derivative products. So all these elements have monetary labels. And the question is, uh, what will happen in the moment when uh, people figure out that this is just imaginary? All these three elements, currencies, uh, credit, and uh, um, and derivative financial products, they are actually just uh, imaginary units of value. It's arbitrary. They can be produced in unlimited numbers simply because uh, numbers can be put in formulas and um, that creates new money. Yeah. And uh, I actually, I have a video on my uh, channel, Mastering the Human Experience, uh, it's a short series, it's like 25 minutes altogether, but it's seven uh, short videos. Uh, the title is The Merchants of Numbers, which describes exactly how this system works and how this, uh, this system is uh, built up. So it's, it's actually because it allows to continuously grow the amount of money just because it's numbers that are put into formulas. Okay. So okay. sooner or later, they are doomed to fail because their true nature is is imaginary. Yeah, hear you. Um, but you know, gold and silver today, they're no longer central in our global monetary system and it's been regulated to a commodity or a type of financial asset, no longer backs currencies. Do, do you think we are going to see, or we'll still see gold and silver restored to their role as global trusted money in the near future? Um, I think it's a question of trust at the end. So what yes. happened when people will uh, lose their faith in, uh, in the currencies, in the existing monetary system? Um, it's um, when, when the people have that blinding flash of the obvious that everything that we are dealing with is imaginary, because we, are, we have now a very, very unfair system. So people wake up every morning, they have to go to work to get some money. And on the other hand, there is some other people who have the ability or the privilege to create unlimited amount of the same money uh, just by punching some numbers in computers. And at some point, people will lose faith in, in the system. And the question is, what do they go to? Uh, they always need something that they perceive as safer. And, you know, I have the experience from Eastern Europe because I grew up in Romania and I... Uh, actually managed the, uh, a food operation business in the early 2000s. And there we dealt with inflation of 20 to 30 percent every year. Uh, we changed the prices in the restaurants every three months. Uh, and um, actually, the local currency was just a hot potato that people didn't trust. And uh, so what they did, and that happened not only in Romania and in all the Eastern European countries, when they transited from uh, plan economy to market economy, mm. um, they relied their savings and their uh, high value transactions in, uh, in dollars or euros. So that was their safe haven. So um, we, had, uh, we were charging customers for our meals in uh, local currency, but our long-term contracts for leases were, um, were, made in, uh, were written in US dollars. And we had to pay the equivalent amount uh, in U.S. dollars every month. That's because of the fluctuation. So coming back to the question is what happens when a critical mass of people loses this, that faith in, in, uh, in the currency? And that's because especially when, when, those current, when people lose faith in dollars and, and euros and, uh, uh, and the other uh, monetary units that we're using now, what is the next safe, uh, safe haven that they can go to? 
And uh, there is where I see uh, precious metals because there is no one else, nothing else that is enough in uh, sufficient supply to serve as money, is uh, su insufficient, uh, it's liquid, and uh, at the same time has a limited, uh, um, it's a limited quantity of. So that's one of the only precious metals that uh, can serve that pur purpose. So yeah, I see that the only way to restore confidence. Yeah, I hear you. Uh, it's all about trust and, and confidence. Um, let's move over to the, the Dow to gold ratio. Uh, we wanted to speak with you today on that subject, which you have been working on, and that's the Dow to gold ratio. In, in fact, you even have a website for that, www.dowtogoldratio.com. Uh, Houston, what was it about that Dow to gold ratio that interests you enough to want to start to build a website just on that topic? Um, it started when I was, um, uh, you know, during my early studies of, uh, of money, when I started to look into, you know, what is money, what the difference between money, currencies and, uh, and all the other things. And um, I was thinking, is there anything... Uh, that can, because understanding that the currencies are just some in, um, imaginary values, um, then uh, I was thinking, what can I do, at least for me, my family, and my, my life, to, um, to find a system or to create an economic system uh, at my level, for my level, that will eliminate currencies out of, out of uh, equation. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is when I discovered the dow to gold ratio and there are good reasons to to use it as a um, as a basis for any uh, let's say investment or uh, um, uh, long-term uh, financial planning strategy okay uh, let's back up a bit now for our subscribers who are unfamiliar with the dow to gold ratio can you uh, kind of walk us through what it shows and how it benefits us um, the Dow to gold ratio is just a number, and you find that number by dividing the value of the Dow uh, Jones in the industrial index uh, or industrial average index to the current price of gold. So let's say that I'm using just some, uh, some round numbers without relevance to today's uh, prices. Let's say if the Dow Jones is 10,000 and gold is 1,000, then the ratio is 1 because you, uh, you sorry, the ratio is 10 because you divide 10,000 to 1,000. If Dow goes to 20,000 and gold remains 1,000, then the ratio goes up to 20 because 20,000 divided by 1,000 is uh, uh, is 20 and then if the let's say the goal goes up to 2000 then the ratio goes from uh, 20 back to 10 because 20,000 divided by 2000 uh, is uh, uh, is 10 so that um, the advantage of of, uh, of using this Dow to goal ratio is exactly because it eliminates the currency in between uh, at least theoretically, Dow Jones is an index of different uh, companies listed on the stock exchange, uh, 30 uh, major companies. And these companies have uh, physical assets, they have uh, employees, the labor of the employees, uh, and the value of the company is actually, uh, even if it is some uh, uh, subjective uh, evaluation be behind it anyway, um, the value of the company is given by these physical assets and the labor and the goods and services they produce. At the same time, gold is also an asset. It's a physical asset that requires labors, uh, that requires labor to, uh, to identify, to find it, to extract, to purify. So actually, when we do, uh, compare these two different elements, uh, then we compare actually two elements that have some form of intrinsic value, especially gold has it much more than uh, than uh, the value of a stock, but it's intrinsic value given by uh, by labor and uh, and uh, physical goods. So that's kind of the the, the great advantage of the um, of using the Dow to gold ratio as a as an indicator. Okay. And uh, what what happens is that in booming times. Uh, well, then the uh, stocks are the darlings of the investors and they uh, rush into buying stocks, they push the uh, stocks higher and then uh, the precious metals uh, are not desired and uh, 
the doubt to goal ratio goes up. Uh, in uh, when you get a reversal, uh, when the, the trend changes back uh, and uh, you have a market crash or a market downturn, then people are looking for, uh, uh, they are focused on uh, preserving the value, they focus on avoiding risk, and then they go into, into precious metals. And uh, then the uh, price of the precious metals goes up and the down to gold ratio goes down. So basically, the best strategy I found out is to, to kind of jump on, uh, on a growing wave at different times if it goes, uh, so you go into stocks when the stock market goes up, and then when the train changes, you go into gold. So actually, you get the benefit of riding the, uh, the wave all the time. So that's, that's how, uh, how I, uh, I look into it. On a long-term Dow to gold ratio from the early 1900s, we can clearly see three major peaks. Do you know what were the circumstances that caused these peaks? I've been spending a lot of time uh, studying these uh, these this long-term trends, and uh, yeah, the first peak was in 1929, the second was in 1966, and the second was in uh, 1999. So, uh, in the 20s, in early 20s, gold uh, was uh, had a fixed price, uh, but what we have to understand that there was actually. Uh, that fixed price of around $20 per ounce was a price that was fixed for monetary purposes. In addition, there was a kind of a, a uh, it was a physical market where people were buying uh, uh, bullions uh, or uh, people were buying uh, jewelry and uh, it was some like uh, some industrial uses, maybe not as much as today for gold. So it was a, a parallel market. Uh, the the price difference was pretty small in the in early 20s. So actually, that peak that we see in the Dow to gold ratio in 1929, it's a reflection of the of the stock market that went up to very very uh, high levels. And there is a lot of reason why the stock market went up, and we don't go into that. We because we are focusing only on the ratio. So the price of gold was relatively constant at that time. If we go to 1966, it was a completely different story. The price, I mean, sorry, not a completely different story. It was kind of a similar story, but circumstances were different. Now the price was fixed at $35 an ounce for monetary purpose. And we had the same, um, the same um, physical market, that open market that was treating gold as a commodity for jewelry and, uh, and industrial uses. But the difference was very small, the same. So in order to uh, minimize the, uh, the difference between the prices uh, of the $35 for monetary purpose and what was on the open market, it was in 1961 was established something called London gold pool. But in early 60s, uh, the U.S. deficits were increasing. We had the Vietnam War and we had the Great Society Project. So that increased the deficit. And actually what happened is that many other countries saw an opportunity of arbitrage because they could bring to $35 to the uh, to United States and get one ounce of gold. And then they could take that ounce of gold and sell, sell it on the market. So actually, uh, the London pool was uh, was closed. Uh, I'm not sure. I think it was 67, 68, uh, because I know that France withdrew from the London pool in 1967. So in that period, actually, the uh, the price of gold started to increase, and that made the 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 that generated the peak of the 1966. Because right after that peak. As the gold price started to increase, the Dow to gold ratio started to go down. In '99, it was a completely different story because now the uh, now gold was completely treated as a commodity. We had the uh, we had the dot com bubble. Um, everybody was uh, making millions and millions on uh, with internet stocks. Uh, so all the money went into uh, into that bubble. Um, Gold and silver were basically Cinderella's, 
maybe worse than that, and uh, nobody wanted them. So that caused the, uh, the pressure metal prices to decline. The, uh, uh, the stock market went, went very high, and that generated the, the peak of 99. And of course, after that, when the stock market crashed uh, in 99, uh, the Dow to gold ratio started to go down. Yeah, so, add- so there are some similarities, but uh, there are also different conditions. Okay. Yeah, I was going to ask you, um, through your research, uh, we just talked about the peaks, but what happened during the, the, the troughs of the, uh, what happened during the troughs to the, the ratio? So what happens is that um, as, as the Dow to gold ratio declines uh, because of either the stock market goes down or the gold price goes up or both at the same time, um, there is a moment when things change uh, because uh, me- precious metals reach a high point or the stock market reaches the lowest point. So in, let's, if we go back to, let's say, 1933, um, actually, I studied this moment in, um, uh, on my website. Uh, we have actually three bottom values, 32, 33, and 34, uh, and that was caused by the fact that um, market stock market was a very low value. Uh, the price of gold was still constant. And what happened is that uh, in 1933, we had that famous uh, executive order. I think it was number 6102, I have it written down, uh, when that mandated all the uh, uh, U.S. citizens and all the, the institutions, U.S. In, uh, institutions to deliver the bullion gold, and um, that after the, and they receive uh, everybody received a compensation of twenty dollars and sixty seven cents per uh, per ounce, and after that the price was increased through administrative measure uh, to uh, thirty five dollars. So basically, that was the form of the quantitative easing of that day because that allows to uh, the money supply to increase again up to um, with 75% basically because from 20 to 35 that was the increase. And that together with those uh, economic uh, uh, stimuli that were given in the uh, 33 in, uh, with a new deal, that that made that causes the stock market to increase again, um, and that generated that trough of uh, in 1933 years. If we go uh, to 1980, that was uh, that time when uh, we had in the 70s we had a lot of uh, high inflation. Uh, it was uh, after uh, President Nixon closed the gold window and completely disconnected the um, the dollar from uh, from uh, from gold, and that what happened is that uh, um, the gold price started to move very high, and the um, that generated the. Uh, actually, the lowest Dow to gold ratio uh, in the history it was 1.8 at that moment. Oh. Um, so um, gold went in in the 70s from 110 dollars, I think, per ounce up to 850. That was the peak in January 1980, and uh, at the same time, the stock market had declined around 20 to 25 percent, somewhere there. So that caused that that very low value of the Dow to gold ratio. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, what, what is interesting is also that the, the first peak occurred in, in 29, as, as we mentioned, and which was the starting year of the Great Depression, and it lasted for about 10 years or, or, or so. And the, the third wave, which peaked in 1999, was so much higher compared to that wave of 1929. Have we experienced the 1929 moment in the stock market Uh, And can we conclude that stock market bubbles are blown even bigger today? Um, They are uh, blowing bigger and bigger because um, 
um, because of the nature of the money that changed, because uh, earlier it was a limitation, a physical limitation uh, due to the uh, to the money being backed by by gold, and uh, now there is no limitation, and uh, it's it's kind of a spiral that that develops because. Um, I have this argument that money or currencies are just numbers in computers. When you combine them, when you create a new financial product, it's just a math, uh, sophisticated mathematical formula. And you, um, so you, so if the money have, um, if the input numbers have monetary labels attached to it, that that label is transferred to the formula through the formula to the end result. So whatever you end up with, it has the same label. If you started with dollars, it ends up with dollars. If it started with euros, it, you end up with euros. So all these fancy uh, derivative products, uh, collateralized debt obligation, collateralized loan obligations, or uh, credit swapped, or this is what it, they are actually. They have formula up where we applied numbers to them. So we have no limitations of numbers, and we have no limitations of, uh, of physical, of uh, mathematical formulas. So what we can do, we create financial assets. Nobody needs them. They don't serve a purpose for, for human needs. They don't cover anything, but they have monetary labels. So when we have those financial assets that allows financial institution to borrow more money to uh, to generate more debt to because they can use those assets as collateral and when they have more uh, more debt they can buy new assets by creating new financial products so that's kind of a escalating uh, process that just made so we we talk about values of Trillion, hundreds of trillions, maybe quadrillion, yeah. uh, in in derivative financial products, and it's just because it's all all numbers and uh, with uh, monetary labels attached to them. That's that's what it is. Okay. So that's why the the stock market keeps inflating. Okay. Uh, from the diagram that you sent us in advance uh, from your website, why do you think C four in wave C? will follow the downward movements of B4 and A4? Um, I think uh, that I, I believe first of in the repetability of the um, of the of the cyclic ability of the of the whole uh, data series and um, C4 will require two things uh, that can happen independently or at the same time. One of them is a uh, a strong deflationary event that will uh, wipe out uh, a significant part of the stock market or a significant value of the stock market and uh, an increase of the um, gold price uh, or the, yeah, basically uh, precious metals in general, but gold um, because this is what we're looking at. So these are the two elements that are required. And um, if we look back and uh, at 19 at the last uh, at phase A4 that was from 37 to 42. Um, we had also uh, a strong deflationary event, and we had the World War II uh, that caused that decline. If we go from the period 76 to 80, it was we mentioned it a, a bit earlier the conditions around that time with uh, high inflation, with uh, um, uh, distrust in, in uh, US dollars as a, uh, as a, as a monetary asset and, um, and an increase of the gold price. So why would this time be different? I mean, why would we have, we have a stock market that is inflated to a very high level? We have uh, uh, gold prices that are suppressed to a very low level uh, and uh, why, why would this time be different? Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, I've been uh, looking at your, your chart a bit more, and um, you know, I can't help noticing that the peaks in each wave was higher, and the troughs of the last two waves were getting lower. 
Right? Can we expect the trough from C4 to be even lower than the trough from B4? Um, that that's hard to imagine, uh, but uh, definitely, yeah, we see that funnel pattern where the highs go higher and the lows go lower. And it's hard to imagine right now because we have what is Dow Jones is around 28,000, uh, gold is somewhere between 14 and 1500. So we talk about the ratio around close to 20. So, how can it be? How can we have a uh, a Dow to go ratio below 180, which was the the, the trough of uh, 1980, and there is only one way it can happen. It uh, you know if we think about uh, let's say uh, what Jim Rickards he he makes a strong case for for gold being uh, at least ten thousand dollars an ounce, and uh, if we take that ten thousand dollars an ounce for gold, and if we um, Take a, a market drop from 28,000 to 14,000. Uh, that's a 50% drop. Uh, we had these drops in in 99. We had these drops in 2008. In 2008 was more like a 35% drop. But in 29, in 1929, the drop was uh, uh, almost 90%. So. So a 50% drop in the in the stock market in a in a in a real crash, it won't scare anyone. I mean, it will scare anyone, but it will, it will not be something we haven't seen before. So just just that's the that's the only way it can happen is like that the market goes down significantly and the and gold goes up significantly. So uh, and we may be and I don't know it may be not be one. It may not be two uh, but even if it's three or or four it's a significant significant change from today's uh, value yeah so that that will wipe out a lot of wealth so we kind of touched just a little bit on on inflation and again looking at your chart uh, it's it's worth noting that waves b2 and b4 in the 70s were characterized by high levels of inflation i think the inflation was about 15% in 1980. How high do you think inflation would be today should the ratio be lower than than one? Would we be back somewhere around that 15% range? I think uh, I think it may be a, a higher. Uh, yeah. I hear a lot of comments about hyperinflation and I try to avoid that term. And, and the reason is that when we talk about hyperinflation, we think Germany of the 1920s, the Weimar Republic, where a bread coal was 4 billion mark, or about Zimbabwe. And lately, we mentioned Venezuela as well. But And of course, the reaction is, if you try to talk about it, the reaction is like, oh, no, 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 this will never happen here. So, uh, so that's why I avoid um, using the word hyperinflation, but I prefer to use the word high inflation. Mm. And what what we have to be aware of, again is that 20, 30% inflation is may not sound like terrible, but it's enough to wipe to to wipe the uh, the value of savings in a in, in a few years. That's um, that's very, very uh, destructive. So uh, we don't have to wait for hyperinflation. We're going to, uh, but I think we will experience uh, a high inflation, especially when uh, when people uh, start losing uh, their, their trust in, uh, in the currency. Because there is one thing that is important to understand, that is the velocity yeah. of money. That is something that central banks cannot control. It's when the public perception changes, they cannot do anything with it. Uh, and unless that public perception or that public trust is restored or reestablished in the currencies, inflation will keep it going. We see, we've seen example of many countries that, okay, what we're going to do? We're going to cut three zeros. We're going to cut four zeros. So it's a, it's a, it's a new money system uh, with the ratio of 1,000 to 1 or 10,000 to 1, like it was in Romania. They did 10,000 to 1. But they could do it only because people changed their perception about the economic environment. Otherwise, they will just look, okay, we have a new banknote, 
It doesn't say a thousand, it says one, but uh, it's still the same thing. It's still, it's, it's like a different potato that is still hot that people want to pass to each other. Yeah. So, um, so unless that confidence is restored, then inflation will keep going. What about the uh, Dow to silver ratio? Are you seeing the same patterns there as well? Um, yeah, it's pretty similar. Uh, and if you look at the, uh, we have to give here, I, I give credit to Macro Trends uh, because they, they do an excellent job to putting up those charts. And if you look at the 100 year Dow to silver ratio, it's very similar. There is still a difference. Uh, and that's from 1945 to uh, 1971. Because uh, in, in the Dow to Gold, we had that spike in 1966 and then a decrease. But then it was in, in silver, it's, it is more of a continuous movement with oscillations up and down. So we're talking about the 1945, it was actually after the end of the Second World War when the Bretton Woods uh, Agreement came into place until 71 when it was the when uh, the gold window was was removed. So in that time gold was still uh, part of the monetary system uh, of the Bretton Woods system and that allowed the gold to be kept fixed at a fixed price and that generated the, the spike in, and uh, and the decline uh, with a peak in 1966. I'm talking about Dow to Gold now. So in Dow to Gold, from uh, it went up and then down. In for silver, in that period of time, uh, it was much more of an oscillation due to the fact that silver was treated like a commodity and was traded like a commodity. So it's it was um, a bit different, but otherwise in the time, but otherwise. For the rest of the time, it follows the same trend. Okay, so if you um if you had to pick between these two things, which would uh which would kind of bring that that Dow to gold ratio down, would it be inflation or a stock market crash? I think it will be a combination of both, um, and that is what what will happen because uh, at some point. Uh, the, the problem we have with stock market right now, uh, there are several elements that are not directly related to the fundamentals. We have a lot of share buybacks from the from the share from the management, um, so that increases the price, and that is because of cheap credit availability. So that many of the companies are just borrowing money. To pay back, and so instead of putting that money, they are borrowing to development and and in the develop the company, and and research and development. They just buy the buyback shares. They that increases the stock price. Management can get the bonuses, and uh, and everybody is happy because they can show to uh, to a significant increase of the stock votes. And um, so there is a lot of artificial. Elements. Another thing is that you have these uh, ETFs. Uh, that is the new thing. Is that passive investing? Everybody is praising now. The you know just write the index because it goes up all the time, so you don't have to worry about it. Uh, what happens is that many of those ETFs um, they will have in the moment there is something uh, that triggers a, a panic. They will have to liquidate uh, the underlying assets. So that means that when the prices starts to go down of, uh, of different stocks, when, when the stock quotations start to go down, then the ETFs go down and people get, uh, people are panicked and they put sell orders and that triggers new sales yeah. and uh, uh, new sales orders coming in the, in the system. And that pushes the pr the price uh, down, and there is new people who see, oh, it go down even more. So now I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, sell it as well. So that that accelerates that process. So I think that will happen. And at the same time, um, any any form of um, uh, inflation or increase of money velocity 
will generate uh, inflation that will uh, so so the combination of these two elements will will bring the down to go ratio way way lower than it is today okay Houston uh, before we wrap up could you let us know how we can follow your research on the Dow to gold ratio yeah I uh, so my my Twitter handle is uh, Justin Rosiwara. It's uh, it's Rosiwara, uh, Justin Rosiwara in in one word. And uh, I know I should be tweeting much more than uh, than I do. I have feedback from people that uh, that say that um, uh, you should put a bit more of a, of those discoveries. Um, and uh, the books, um, two of the books. It's uh, the one that you showed, Gas Money, and this Wealth Wealth Maker. They are available on my website. I have another website, Mastering the Human Experience. And I have two other smaller books that uh, explain in detail, I don't know if you, um, about uh, uh, all the issues around money, currencies, credit, inflation, deflation. These can be bought on Amazon. So that would be the... Uh, the best thing that uh, that I can recommend is like reading uh, reading my materials and uh, um, and try to get an understanding of uh, what's going on. So, okay. Anything else you'd like the viewers to know? Uh, I like to. I would like to quote uh, Lynette Zhang from ITM Trading. She always says that uh, remember shields are made of metal. So. Um, if you want to be protected, that's uh, that's what I would like to to close with. Uh, and um, gold and silver uh, are the elements that are going to protect uh, in uh, in what's coming. And we don't know what's when it's coming, but uh, definitely we want to be prepared. Yeah, I hear you. Completely agree with that. Uh, Houston Rosiwara, we, we appreciate you spending time with us. And um, that was a nice phrase from Lynette that, that you quoted. And I um, want to wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you. Same to you. Same to you, Patrick. In regards to all your team, you do an excellent job. So, uh, so thank you for that. Uh, your services are really, really needed in the market. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for those kind words. And we appreciate also the, the work that you do. That was Justin Rosierara, who is the author of the book God's Money, an in-depth examination of the Bible verses that mention gold and silver. To find out more about Justin's work, please follow him on Twitter. If you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to the SBTV channel to be updated on new content. And do also find us on SBTV on iTunes and Spotify.